Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ray Dubois, the senior advisor here at CSIS. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, on behalf of John Hamry, our president and CEO, I welcome you uh, to this panel, a congressional panel on the Quadrennial Defense Review and the National Security Strategy in Formulation. Uh, as you may know, uh, CSIS has held a series of eight different QDR panels uh, over the summer uh, period, beginning in early June. Uh, began with uh, Michelle Flournoy, uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, and from a colleague of ours here at CSIS. Uh, she was followed by the four service chiefs, uh, along with uh, General Mattis, uh, the Joint Force Com Commander, uh, General Renwart, the NORTHCOM That's Commander, great. Great. I read all and uh, General Haas Cartwright, the really Vice helpful. Chairman Good. of the Joint Chiefs. The QDR, as you know, is a creature of the Congress, and, uh, and every four years the Secretary of Defense reports uh, to the Congress on the national security strategy. Uh, this particular QDR, having worked on the prior one, uh, I believe will be quite uh, instructive. Uh, I think it will provide the intellectual and analytic underpinning uh, for the announcements that the Secretary of Defense uh, made on the 6th of April, as well as the announcements that will be forthcoming in the 2011 budget plus four uh, that will be coming out, as you know, uh, in January. That will be the first pure Obama budget. This is also the first Gates QDR, and arguably the last Gates QDR. Uh, the members of Congress who you see here in front of you, Senator Wicker of Mississippi, Senator Udall of Colorado, Congressman Thornberry of Texas, Congressman Marshall of Georgia. The two senators serve on the Senate Armed Services Committee. The two members of the House serve on the House Armed Services Committee. It should be noted that the two senators also served in the House of Representatives, and they have promised me that they will keep to the five-minute rule, allowing their <laughs> colleagues from the House an opportunity to speak. Uh, we believe that the involvement of the Congress uh, is a very important involvement with respect to the QDR. Uh, what they say today, in the teeth of the debate on the floor of the Senate with respect to the National Defense Authorization Act of 2011, uh, ought to be uh, at the least very interesting and perhaps even informative with respect to the environment to which the QDR will be released after the first of the year. Uh, there will be uh, perhaps the Secretary of Defense will appoint an independent panel which is called for in the legislation although prior secretaries have not necessarily honored that particular encouragement by the Congress. I understand in the House bill there is a provision to have a congressionally appointed panel of the QDR. Hmm. Uh, I, when I sent out the invitations, when we sent out the invitations for this panel, uh, a friend of mine who I serve with on several boards, Paige Haper, uh, former Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition, said it was terribly brave of me to expect four members of Congress, two of the House and two of the Senate, to stick to merely an hour in discussing such a complex and important subject. Uh, brave or not, uh, I think we are going to be very fortunate to hear from them. And I will now ask Senator Udall to lead off. After the four men finish, Dr. Murren Lead, my colleague who chaired and moderated the prior eight panels, will moderate this panel. So for those of you who wish to ask questions, yeah. please identify yourself and your affiliation and uh, get to the heart of the question. No speech is necessary. Senator Udall, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ray. Good afternoon to, to all of you. The, one of the prime reasons I uh, accepted this invitation, other than to spend some time with my erstwhile House colleagues, was because of the tremendous work that CSIS is doing uh, in regards to the QDR, but of course on an ongoing basis. And, it forced me, this invitation, to work through uh, all of the fora 
Ray and Marin and the rest of you who participated that you all have been holding. Very valuable, very insightful, uh, very interesting set of documents and conversations. So I, I'm sure that uh, my colleagues uh, and I want to add value to that. I'm here as much as well to listen and learn from the three gentlemen surrounding me and uh, from Marin and from all of you. Um, we were challenged, Roger and I, back in the, in the green room to be short, to be succinct. Uh, I'm inclined to tell a quick story about Calvin Coolidge, who was known for being succinct uh, and short and to the point. And the press corps had a bet, uh, as the story goes, that they couldn't get uh, him to say three words, a particular reporter. And the reporter went up and, and told uh, President Coolidge that there was a bet in the press pool that he wouldn't say three words. And Coolidge uh, responded, you lose. Uh, so I'm going to try and be succinct uh, and to the point uh, so we can have a conversation this afternoon. I think this uh, QDR process uh, is one of the most interesting ones that we've had in a number of cycles, as I think you all agree. Uh, Secretary Gates said that he uh, just presented the first 21st century budget for the DOD. This obviously will be the first 21st century uh, QDR, you could argue. Uh, there are key roles that uh, all of the various institutions play. I see Congress's role as reviewing what's in the QDR substantively, and then, of course, we have the power of the purse and how we then apply the priorities identified in the QDR to how the money is allocated is key. Uh, a strategy is a path down which you spend money. That's clearly a key element of the QDR, and it's an important tool uh, for those of us in the Congress. I, I know we'll get to the meat of some of the uh, substantive debates uh, in the QDR, but uh, my own experience serving, again, with, uh, with Congressman Marshall, Congressman Thornberry in the House was this increasing focus on the integration of and the interaction between conventional warfare approaches and irregular warfare approaches. That has to have a central focus in the QDR. Uh, there are other key areas that, we're, as I've said, we'll, we'll kick around here. Two Colorado-centric uh, uh, comments as I finish that are tied to the QDR because it, it sometimes it, it uh, seeps down, sometimes it floods down. Uh, we have an ongoing debate in Colorado about the training needs of the Army in a little place called Pinion Canyon. And there's a group uh, of farmers and ranchers who've lived there for generations, Jim and Mac, and they are patriots. Many of them are veterans, uh, but they're very concerned about another 100 or 200,000 acres uh, being transferred over the Army for training. I hope the QDR will help us get a better sense of the Army's training needs. Secondly, Congressman Marshall and I were both eagerly awaiting uh, the arrival of the 46th, the 47th, or the 48th BCT uh, to Fort Stewart in Jim's case and to Fort Carson in my case. The Secretary's decision to hold off uh, standing up those BCTs I think can be uh, uh, defended. He said we're undermanned and, and overstructured, uh, but there are two BCTs in Germany that may well be redeployed. And I know both Jim and I would be very curious about how the QDR sets out the strategy in the long term and whether those BCTs might be coming to either Fort Stewart or Fort Carson. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, I appreciate uh, the invitation to, to be here, and I certainly appreciate all that CSIS does to enlighten us all on, on national security. Um, I guess the first point I'd like to make is I think it's very important that we take this uh, QDR process seriously. Sometimes in the past it's been criticized as uh, budget-driven rather than strategy-driven. Uh, sometimes in the past it's been criticized as merely a justification for what they wanted to do anyway. Um, and, and neither of those is, is particularly helpful. Uh, if you think about all of our lives, we have a tendency to focus on the urgent and let the maybe less urgent at the moment but very important things lapse. And, and this uh, is, is designed, was designed by Congress to make us, at least every four years, focus on the important, not just the war that we're fighting today, not just how many planes and ships we're, we're, we're going to buy next week. And, and, and if you look at the legislation itself, it, it, it's heartening to me because it's pretty strong. It talks about the Secretary of Defense require, having to look at the overall strategy for the country and then the people and budget and resources and plans to implement that strategy. It's where the rubber meets the road. Are you just going to have a piece of paper out there that says it's the strategy and then do what you want to do year by year in defense bills and, and budgets? Or are you going to bring those two things together? This is the opportunity to bring those things together, and that doesn't happen very often, it seems to me, in, in 
public policy. A lot of the times we lurch from one thing to the next. Uh, this is the opportunity to bring it together, and that's why I think it, it must be taken seriously. Not that we can predict the future, although the, the legislation requires a 20-year orientation, a 20-year time frame as you're, as you're doing this. Uh, we can't predict the future, but, but on the other hand, that sort of planning helps us to understand better our strengths, vulnerabilities, and can help and, and should help guide us as we move ahead. Secondly, I favor an independent look at this in what was, has been called the National Defense Panel. Uh, the legislation, as Ray mentioned, requires that there be an independent assessment, but the past several QDRs have been more of a kind of an in-house red team critique of what the Pentagon came up with. It was only the first QDR in 1997 that had a truly independent group of experts that made their own cut at it, and I found that tremendously helpful, uh, partly because it challenged assumptions in the underlying QDR, partly because it came up with, with issues that it didn't think got proper attention, and I mined that thing for ideas for years to come, it was, it, to be selfish about it. And, and you, you don't want to have, in my view, kind of an excuse for guerrilla warfare for people who you know, are afraid the QDR is, is taking the wrong way and they want to protect their rice bowl. But I do think getting outside smart folks to have their own cut at it is a helpful resource and a check on what the building does. Last point I want to mention is at the same time the QDR is going, there's also something called the Nuclear Posture Review. A lot of times the nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrent, I think, kind of get <coughs> sidelined as, well, that's not really relevant anymore. We're past the Cold War. We don't have to worry about it. Uh, we have to worry about it a lot. Uh, I believe that nuclear weapons are still the central element of our national defense strategy. And I'm a little worried that the president went to Moscow and already agreed to cut a specific number of warheads and number of delivery systems before the nuclear posture review ever figured out what was in our national interests. Uh, maybe they've done all the work ahead of time and consulted with our allies and all the things that one needs to do when dealing with nuclear weapons, but I worry a, a little that we're getting the cart before the horse. And yet, it's not just Russia, as you all know. Lots of people, friends and potential adversaries, watch very closely what we do with our nuclear deterrent, and, and they, uh, uh, because what we do affects them so much. Uh, that needs to get just as much attention as the QDR part of it as the two things go together. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much and I want to thank all of you for readjusting your schedules. I, I really didn't know that uh, we'd have a room full because this was initially going to be at three o'clock and uh, we still have votes uh, and uh, now those votes have been postponed till uh, to four so uh, we could have had it at three anyway, but but I uh, appreciate you uh, making all the phone calls and sending out the emails and and uh, getting the crowd here at the right time. I thought what I would do is say a word about the the national defense panel uh, that that we've already uh, heard about, and then um, maybe mention um, three or four things that were in the QDR last time that I don't think will be the same for sure uh, this time. Uh, indeed, the, we will go to conference with the National Defense Panel being a conferenceable item. Uh, it's in the House version. Uh, it, is, it is not in the SASC version and uh, will undoubtedly not be amended on the floor. So that's something we'll be talking about. What the House version does, it directs the panel to conduct an assessment of the assumptions, strategy, findings, costs, and risks of the report with particular attention paid to the risks uh, described in that report. Um, it also, the structure of it is something that uh, if, if it's a matter that goes before conference, we might want to, to revisit it. Uh, I, I think it would be good if the panel were totally uh, bipartisan. The, the, it establishes a 12-person panel now. Six would be chosen by the Democratic leadership of House Armed Services and, and SASC to be, to be chosen by Secretary Gates 
and four remaining uh, are delegated to the ranking Republican members. Um, so that that's the that's the structure of it and the task of it. Um, I happen to know that Senator McCain thinks this is a bad idea. Um, he thinks it's it's a matter of appointing a panel to second guess the secretary. Um, also, he doesn't think it's a very good job for someone to accept for a year uh, to, to, to present this report. The, I think the House version envisions an interim report and then a final report. And, uh, and thirdly, uh, Senator McCain says this will cost $6 million and it's just not worth the extra funds it would take to, to actually have this panel. So. Um, I think it's something, uh, and, and Senator Levin actually is not that opposed to it. But uh, I think the chairman feels it's something that we need to have in conference uh, that needs to be a conferenceable item, and uh, and and so that it's it, it's something that he will have to to bargain with. Now, um, for for um, at least three things that I thought I would quote from the 2006 QDR that I do not think will be um, will be in this one. Um, and one is the two major theater war construct. It's a, it, it would be a major departure from, uh, from what we've had uh, and what has been uh, our strategy and, and, and position for decades. Uh, but the, page 36 of the 2006 QDR says, swiftly defeat adversaries in two overlapping military campaigns. Page 38 says wage two nearly simultaneous conventional campaigns or one conventional campaign if already engaged in a large scale, long duration, irregular campaign. Well, we know uh, that, that actually um, uh, General Cartwright has already testified advocating, quote, a departure from the two major theater war construct that we have here, adhered to in the past. And Secretary Gates, in a joint press conference with Admiral Mullen on June 18, stated, quote, if there's one major aspect of the QDR that I have insisted that we try to get away from, it's this construct that we've had for such a long time that we size our forces to be able to fight two major com combat operations. So um, I'll be surprised if, if this language from 2006 doesn't change. Um, a second thing would be reduction in, in military manpower that was advocated in 2006. Uh, to quote from the QDR then, technological advances, including dramatic improvements in information management and precision weaponry, have allowed our military to generate considerably more combat capability with the same or in some cases fewer numbers of weapons platforms with lower levels of manning. I don't think this QDR will be talking about lower levels of manning. I think they'll be talking about boots on the ground. And thirdly, uh, transition from garrison forces to expeditionary forces as part of the transformation concept in 2006, um, the Defense Department is, and I quote, is transforming and how the senior leaders of the department view that transformation, it's useful to view it as a shift of emphasis to meet the new strategic environment from static defense garrison forces to mobile expeditionary operations. Perhaps that will be um, thought of, uh, re rethought also in this QDR. And finally, uh, 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 final thing I don't expect to be in the QDR would be any mention of the need for a strong American economy. Um, but clearly, when you're talking about 4% of GDP um, invested in national security and national defense, uh, it matters what your GDP looks like. Um, and clearly, we've seen from experience um, the Soviet Union's 1980s military strategy simply couldn't be sustained by their economy. So the economy is going to have a lot to do with, with what our defense posture looks like over time. Thank you.
Uh, I actually think, uh, just as an aside before I give my remarks, that, that what I thought I'd say when I got here, that the defense panel is a good idea. And as far as formally second-guessing the, uh, uh, the Defense Department and the Secretary, Congress is going to do it anyway. We might as well have the help of real experts in doing it. Uh, and uh, $6 million sounds like a lot of money, but the help that that group can, can <coughs> give us is pretty significant. Uh, maybe our questioning, our formal questioning, will be guided a little bit better than it otherwise would. And in any event, all of you are going to be questioning the QDR. So there's going to be a lot of second guessing going on. So I thought about today's panel and the QDR generally because of the 20 year sort of timeline, the focus. Uh, it, it dawned on me that a good starting point is uh, Fukuyama's argument, what back in the late 80s, early 90s, after the fall of the Cold War, that we'd, we'd reached the end of history. And if he's right, then the S end of history that we're in, this is not a very stable state at all. We've got all these threats out there that go well beyond the conventional threats that we're all familiar with, and well beyond just Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, the globe is very interdependent. It's not very well integrated. Population's growing rapidly. We're going to have all kinds of challenges, climate, weather, uh, challenges that are, uh, you know, sort of dumped in our laps as a result of our economic system, our global economic system that we can't predict right now. Uh, the only way, in my opinion, that we deal effectively with these challenges is by partnering well with groups across the globe. It's probably ultimately going to be, a, at least in, in the 20 year time frame, to effectively address all of the security challenges, pandemics included, uh, a partnership of partnerships. Because one partnership isn't going to get it. And we're going to have to effectively be able to work with a broad range of countries, persuading them that they should, adopt strat they should adopt strategies that meet global needs and our needs. Uh, and so it just sort of occurs to me that the QDR is going to have to anticipate what our partners will be willing to do in the future and how they are going to evolve. Of course, what our enemies, the threats, are and how our enemies are going to evolve and how the threats are going to evolve. And then finally, and uh, almost shamefully, uh, DOD is going to have to figure out how the U.S. government is going to evolve in all of this. Uh, and that's the part of this process that really disturbs me. Uh, the rest of it we're stuck with. In planning for 20 years down the road, we are going to have to take all of these things into account. And we're going to have to go about the process of trying to estimate how different characters are going to act. But that we don't have a whole government approach to this, that we've got DOD out there with the QDR as opposed to our government out there with the QDR, I think is a real shame. And it's a real problem for the QDR because it basically involves the Defense Department trying to predict how the federal government itself will evolve and what capabilities will be brought to the table by all of the different other players in uh, the federal government to try and address these threats that uh, are obviously out there on the horizon. Uh, in thinking about the challenge that the Defense Department has in this QDR, since addressing these threats that are out there on the horizon uh, won't effectively occur unless it's a whole government effort, uh, that includes the Congress. And so not only does the Defense Department have to assume what other groups within our own country are going to be able to do to address the, these, these uh, challenges, but the Defense Department is going to have to make some judgment concerning whether or not Congress is going to be capable of reorganizing itself. One of the hurdles that the Defense Department runs into when it tries to change, when it tries to address novel new threats, is the structure of Congress and, and Congress's tendency to want to maintain uh, jurisdictional power, personal power, Congress's tendency to try and stay with the familiar. So the QDR has got to take that into account as well, uh, which to me at least means that uh, the QDR is, is going to be really challenged. Uh, uh, it, uh, if, if it's done well, if it, if, it, if it actually addresses all of that, it's going to step on a lot of toes. I don't see how it can avoid stepping on a lot of toes. 
A uh, number of you probably read the article in the paper this morning uh, by Ladondo, I think it was, uh, about the U.S. being, the U.S. military being constrained in Iraq. Uh, I, for one, found that to be pretty instructive. I mean, that is the sort of future that we face. Uh, to me, the quality of the personnel that we put on the field to leverage our power, our resources, through this partnership of partnerships, it's the quality of the personnel that we put on the field. And it's not just in the military. It's across all branches, across all uh, 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 departments. Uh, that quality is going to determine how effective we are. And right now, we're sort of growing willy-nilly the military. And I don't think we're paying as much attention to quality as we need to be paying attention to quality. And the decisions that we're making right now concerning growth are decisions that constrain us 10 to 20 years from now. What we're doing right now, as far as building our military forces, uh, are those decisions that we're making right now effectively constrain what we're going to be able to do 10 to 20 years from now, because we're going to have those folks with us during this entire period of time. With that, uh, I'll stop. I think I've covered my five minutes. Um, thank you very much. Let me add my welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming this afternoon. Um, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the comments about the earlier series of events that we held. There was a report published on Friday that uh, summarizes those events and gives a little bit of analysis that's available on our website. If Hopefully many of you got the notification of that, but if not, feel free to check the website and, and take a look. Um, let me exercise the prerogative of the chair and start with a quick question following up on Senator Wicker and Congressman Marshall's comments about what the QDR, what you would like to see in the QDR. Um, Senator Wicker talked a little bit about what he thought wouldn't be in there, and Congressman Marshall mentioned some things that he thinks should be there. Do either of you have thoughts on things that you think are important that the QDR address? Well, in, in addition to the nuclear issue, that I mentioned, I'd, I'd throw out these new domains of warfare, cyber and also space. Uh, I'm convinced there will be a lot of words about cyber in, in the QDR, uh, but it is an enormous challenge for a lot of the reasons that Jim was just talking about to, to get the whole government uh, together, and yet it is a part of defending the country as much as guarding sea lanes and air lanes. Uh, I think space it may not talk as much about, and I worry about that. We are becoming more and more dependent upon space. Uh, people see that dependency, and therefore it creates a potential vulnerability for us. And what is our approach going to be? Are we going to defend our assets in space? And that gets off into uh, all sorts of, of controversial topics. So I think those new domains of warfare are, are very important to be included. I think Mac mentioned the uh, uh, nuclear posture review. There's one underway as well with our, when it comes to our space uh, assets, and it includes also the cybersecurity realm. And I think we've all been sitting in some very interesting classified briefings that raise real concerns because of the civilian military uh, interface, uh, not to mention the other uh, relationships we have with, with other countries and uh, with other societies. So it's, it's uh, clear this is an area we really have to pay some attention. Uh, I would add uh, uh, to what Congressman Marshall said as well, and, and, and what he's really talking about is a world that works. Uh, we're, and I think we're going to ask the military to take this concept of jointness and apply it across a, a, an even tougher barrier, which is into the civilian sector, into the uh, other agencies of the government. I, I would note that uh, in uh, the Pentagon's own uh, call to action, uh, in regards to the QDR, there's mention of DNI and there's mention of DHS, but not USAID or the State Department. And yet you have uh, the Secretary, you have Admiral Mullen and others saying, we've, we've got to have a better coordinated approach here, particularly given the lessons in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Three other quick points. Uh, I would add, uh, and, and these won't surprise anybody, that, and I mentioned this in my initial remarks, this, this uh, hybrid warfare conversation we're having, how do you determine uh, conventional forces and how they can also be prepared to fight in a regular war setting. That's number one. Two is the strain on our forces, but also the opportunity, uh, because increasingly we understand this is not just uh, general officers, it's certainly not mid-level officers. It's that corporal uh, and that sergeant on the ground that are really going to have the effect that we, that we need them to have. And uh, 
Then finally, I, I was pleased to hear Jim talk about climate. Uh, and I know Secretary Flournoy has been pointing out the real potential threats there. So those are, those are three other additional elements I think have to be considered front and center. Senator Walker? Uh, well, uh, I, I've, been, uh, I've been trying to get an answer um, recently about the size and, and, um, and the look of our fleet four years out, uh, 20 years out. Um, and, and we had the Navy in before the committee the other day, uh, or a subcommittee, I can't remember. And, and, um, and I asked the question, are we just giving lip service to this 313-ship Navy? Uh, whether we're engaged in conventional, traditional warfare, or, uh, or whether it's uh, just pro projecting power around the globe to meet these ir irregular um, threats that we have, Regardless of that, uh, we're going to need a bigger Navy. And uh, uh, full disclosure, we build uh, boats in Mississippi, and, uh, and we kind of like to build boats. But um, <coughs> being able to, to keep our industrial capacity um, and, um, and, and churn out boats uh, often enough that it is uh, economical is something I'd like to see us talk about. And when I asked the question, aren't we just giving lip service to this 313-ship Navy, uh, basically the, uh, the essence of the response was we're waiting on the QDR for that. And, uh, but but uh, Admiral Mullen believes that a 313-ship Navy is a minimum, and, uh, and it's necessary for, uh, for our national defense and national security. So I'll be interested to see what the QDR says about that. Uh, another thing, you know, we do. We, this is about budgets, and it's about trade-offs. And, and uh, we, I think, um, you heard from Secretary Flournoy that that the but that the QDR wouldn't be driven by the budget; would be constrained by the budget. Um, so I'd I'd like to have a little discussion at some point, uh, either in the QDR or the D National Defense Panel that follows it about the discussion leading up to the conclusions, what trade-offs there were, uh, what risks we analyzed um, in getting to the plan, and what risks we are willing to accept as not being something that we can afford to address because of budget constraints. Well, I. I just staying, I, there are lots of things I'd like to see in the QDR, but <clears throat> sort of staying with the theme that I started out with. Uh, I'd like the QDR to address a better planning process uh, than the QDR process. Uh, and, uh, and so that would be one useful thing that the QDR could do. It's pretty clear to, I think, everybody in this room that it's a lot easier for uh, our country to sustain effort, spend money on things that are identified as security issues than on other international matters. And we're in this era in which an awful lot of the things that state USAID uh, and others are doing really are security issues. Uh, and yet, it's very difficult for us to fund on a long-term basis in a democracy where people are going to take cheap shots all the time uh, on spending elsewhere instead of spending here in the United States. It's awful difficult for us to, to fund in a sustained way the kinds of things that they ought to be doing in this new world for our security. So I hope the QDR will talk a little bit about that. Uh, I personally have every single time the choice between putting a particular program in DOD or in state has come up. I've always favored putting it in DOD because I actually think we can do it. We'll stick with it. We'll, we'll go ahead and see that program through as opposed to putting it elsewhere and then having it attacked. So something, some, something along the lines of talking about how the funding becomes stabilized to do a lot of the things that many people would describe as feel-good things, we should be doing in the United States, why are we doing them elsewhere, what's this got to do with our security, anticipating those kinds of political problems and just addressing them head, heads up in the QDR would be good. I want to make sure that we have time for all of you to ask questions, so we'll just go to Q&A. If people could come up to the microphones in the front, we'll try to take two or three questions at a time so that we can get to as many of them as possible in the time we have left. So if people have questions, if they could step to the front. 
And in the meantime, I'll ask a quick question while people step up just to, since people seem shy. Um, I just wanted to follow on to Congressman Marshall's points about the challenges associated with congressional organization and how, what an obstacle that poses to whole of government uh, approaches to things and get, get your take on the prospects for modification to that. How, how do we bring that about? What's the way forward? I'll start out and say that somebody has to have sort of a clear statement that it is a problem and here's how it needs to be reorganized. You cannot expect Congress itself to say that Congress is the problem or part a major part of the problem that Congress should reorganize itself. Uh, and perhaps as part of the QDR, there, 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 there would be suggestions along those lines. Certainly the panel uh, should think about those kinds of issues and how Congress might think about uh, reorganizing itself. There, yeah, there, it, Jim, it's a really, it's just such an excellent point. And maybe you've got to find a way first to, to the mechanism by which you make those recommendations. But we, we talk about kicking problems down the road with studies, and that's a long-held uh, legislative tactic. But you look at the 9-11 Commission, you look at the Homeland Security Commission, both those commissions served us very, very well. Maybe this is an opportunity for that kind of an approach. And okay. Thanks. All right, let's go to questions. My name is Jay Mohan. I work on the Army staff. Senator Udall, you mentioned uh, about relieving the stress on the force. What are some of the things that you all could see the QDR to do? Uh, the Army had more suicides in January and May than <clears throat> the combat casualties. So what are some of the things that we could look at to, to relieve the stress on the force? Thank you. Yeah, you want to just... I'm uh, Hank Gaffney from CNA. In my 47 years watching defense here in Washington, I've noticed that the uh, defense budget is determined exogenously by OMB, depending on what the administration can uh, have as a tolerable deficit. Of course, we have intolerable deficits right now. Um, and I notice that Congress never deviates from that grand total, maybe only 1% plus or minus over all these years. Uh, do you, the QDR terms of reference as they're set out now would probably require a doubling or tripling of the defense budget. Uh, as far as ships goes, all Congress has to do is add 10 billion and they would be able to buy the 313, but they never do. And I just wondered, um, isn't Congress restrained by its own budget resolutions and uh, by other factors like that? And given health care and uh, energy, isn't it also a restraint on uh, an unconstrained QDR? Those two, stresses on the force and budget resolution. I, I, I just, I'll take the first. The, the QDR probably is not going to have any immediate impact on current stress on the force. It's this long-term view. It's sort of the current stuff that we're trying to do that can have, you know, that can give some help, trying to decrease the amount of rotation, uh, focusing on soldier wellness uh, and, and mental wellness as well. Uh, post-traumatic growth programs as opposed to post-traumatic stress programs, uh, preparing uh, troops for the kinds of trauma and stress and et cetera, better preparing, I guess I should say, than we do uh, for dealing with that. And that's, it goes beyond uh, just in combat. It's also family matters, you know, personal matters, those sorts of things. Those are all things we're working on right now. I, I know you know that already. Uh, but I would say that the QDR, which is this sort of 10 to 20 years out plan, is unlikely to have an impact on stress right now. Except maybe as it deals with total numbers in the yeah. future as you go out right. 10, 20 years. And, 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 and that may not solve the stress problem, but it is one of the, how many people you bring to implement the strategy is, is one of the issues. On, on the budget right quick, uh, I don't think Congress is constrained by anything except its own political will. Look at how much money we have spent on so much stuff since January. And so if Congress wanted to spend $10 billion on new ships, of, of, of course it could. Uh, my, one of my beefs in previous QDRs is that it didn't lay out the, the choices and consequences and risk plainly. Um, and, and more what we get is, you know, we got this whole thing figured out and, and we are just going to tell you, you know, and, and everything's perfect and hunky-dory with the world. It, it's, it's not that way. We make choices and we take increased risk in some areas. And I think people who would read such stuff 
would appreciate having those risks laid out. Uh, we're not funding, or, you know, uh, hypothetically, we're not funding this many ships, and therefore we have increased risk in these areas. Being more right. plain spoken about the risks that go, I think would be a helpful exercise. Now, I think that's the, the really the point I was trying to make uh, in the trade-offs. Um, it is hard to offer an amendment to <coughs> spend an extra $10 billion. Uh, you, we are, I don't know that we're constrained by the QDR, but we are constrained by our budget resolutions. Uh, it would be helpful, though, um, if the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, who says a 313 ship Navy is an absolute requirement, uh, would somehow uh, go back and, and, and work with the secretary and, and the bean counters uh, in the administration and actually uh, provide us with an alternative path to getting where uh, they say uh, we need to be. It, it's hard for the public to, to hear those statements about the, the need for more ships um, and view those credibly uh, if, if there's no suggestion about getting there. And I'm hopeful that the, the testimony in the committee that we're waiting on the QDR uh, will, will turn out to, to be true. But Because I do worry um, that, that we don't have the means to project enough power um, around the world in terms of our Navy. With regard to the stress um, on the force, um, you know, I was out at Walter Reed today, um, Mississippi uh, um, Air Force Sergeant uh, lost a leg and, and um, is fighting to save the other one. Um, he said that he is required to get counseling whether he believes he needs it or not. And I'll just say, having been a member of the uh, Veterans Affairs Committee um, uh, and the uh, Armed Services Committee and um, VA uh, approves in the House, I think we're, we're beginning to do better um, in, in terms of uh, post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury, although we're not, uh, we're not there where we need to be by any means. But we're, we're improving. If I, if I could just follow up quickly on what Roger said, I, I think once again we're going to ask uh, our military and more specific the men and women in uniform to help us uh, better understand both opportunities but challenges that we have as as human beings, uh, and right now the military is beginning to open some doors into this wonderful organ uh, that we call our brain, uh, and we're going to see in the long run, I think, great advances in understanding how our brain operates, how it works, how you keep it healthy, how you repair it, how you help it recover. Uh, and as uh, the military has done both in developing technologies and equipment, uh, as, as well as, uh, for example, integrating uh, on the cutting edge of our society. Uh, there is a very much a silver lining here. Jim, Jim, I think, was on point that it's easy to start to talk about the QDR in the broadest terms and try and solve a lot of problems with the QDR when some are outside the realm of the QDR. And I think Mac pointed out the size of the force for the gentleman asked the question about this training. That's really where I think we start. And, uh, and then we look at the kind of training and the kind of, uh, particularly for mid-level officers that we're going to put in place to encourage them uh, to uh, serve in the ways that really match the 21st century challenges in front of us. But they're rewarded for pursuing the kind of training that makes sense uh, in, in the world that we now face. Okay. Cindy Ray, um, <laughs> LMI Government Consulting. <coughs> With regard to the concept of taking a holistic government approach to the QDR, can you talk a little bit about how you see the new quadrennial diplomacy and development review that is just beginning this fall and the traditional QDR interacting and affecting each other? Uh, I'll, we'll take two more. And go ahead. Timothy Walton, Georgetown University. Uh, my question is regards to the F-22. Over the last year, uh, Congress has received conflicting testimony. Um, General Schwartz himself stated that 243 is a medium to high risk estimate, but now is encouraging that the Air Force doesn't buy more of the aircraft. Um, in weighing risks going forth, if whether we should dedicate more resources to counterinsurgency forces or more conventional strategies, how do you think the uh, QDR should assess this question? And maybe personally, 
do you think the United States should buy more F-22s? Okay, and one last one. And I'm Bill Whitaker from the UN Information Center here in DC. And I have a two-part question very quick. Um, Representative Marshall, you were talking about a partnership of partnerships. And I was curious, one, if you felt that international peacekeeping operations, if uh, do you see them as an aspect of uh, US national security? And two, just generally, the uh, international yeah. community and international organizations, how do they figure into your assessment of um, US national security in the future? No. If, if I can start on, on the State Department or the quadrennial diplomas, whatever they, they call it these days. QDDR. QDDR. <laughs> I, I, that, that strikes a chord with me because someone who served on the original National Defense Panel in 1997 suggested to me that we ought to make the State Department do a QDR. Take their strategy and look at their resources and people and, and plans and see whether and how they match up. So I introduced a bill to do that. Uh, many years ago, and I have ever since, and it's never gotten any attention, which shows my ineffectiveness apparently as a legislator, until uh, Secretary Clinton announced that they were going to do it themselves uh, here last week. I don't know that that completely gets to where both Jim and I would like us to be in a whole government approach, but it's not just the Pentagon that needs to plan and prepare for the future and bring its resources uh, to match its budget strategy. So I'm very delighted that at least there is a step in that direction being taken. And, and so that part, that instrument of, of national power, can, can take a step up uh, closer to where it should be. OK, we have a, anybody else want to address that question? And then we can turn to the other group. No, OK, um, we'll talk about uh, non-governmental organizations and international. Yeah, I, uh, I refer to a, loosely to a partnership of partnerships, um, and I, I do think that what uh, uh, our international allies do uh, and international forces do, uh, and I, I, I can't think of an exception to this, uh, that it winds up helping our security as well as global security. Uh, and so, uh, I, and when I say a partnership of partnerships, I, I have in mind that we'll still have state actors predominating. Uh, uh, states are becoming less and less important uh, as you see more and more non-state uh, phenomena uh, that are global, internet driven, and otherwise uh, coming to the forefront. But I think uh, a, a lot of the organization will still focus on states, trying to prop up states, trying to work effectively with states uh, so that within their borders they're controlling the threats or prepared to address the kinds of threats, not just military but beyond that, that can become challenges for the whole globe. And then we had the so Mac, Mac I, if I could go back to the first question, I, I came here armed with the, uh, the idea that you've had, which is uh, we require that kind of uh, joint review. And let's see what happens and maybe we can join forces. Uh, yeah across the Capitol, uh, it, because, it, because it should happen. Amen. Um, F-22, I've sat through a lot of hearings. Uh, in the uh, SAS markup, uh, I voted uh, with uh, Chairman Levin and Ranking Member McCain to keep the number where the Secretary proposed it uh, should be. Uh, having said that, uh, I expect a, a uh, you say a robust debate on the on the floor of the and, Senate and a very close vote and a very close vote and I think both both the camps if, it, if you can divide people into two camps in that regard ha have legitimate points of view and I think uh, the members of the House and the Senate uh, will bring those cases and we'll we'll see what happens. I, I'm somebody who's on the other side of the F-22 issue. Yeah. Where are you from? <laughs> I'm from Georgia, but there's no F-22 work. That, that, that the avionics will be done in the district. Doesn't matter whether you've got 187 or 243 or whatever the number is. I do think it speaks to the, man, the question, and I don't be interested what the, the group here thinks of the uh, manufacturing base and, and how do we keep it strong? How do we make sure that it's agile? Rogers alluded to it when it comes to shipbuilding. F-22 debate is is about that as well. And those are those are very legitimate questions that we're that we're grappling with right now. I don't want to give uh, short uh, shrift to the question about uh, international peacekeeping forces. Uh, there, uh, I, 
on the one hand, um, it, it's hard to keep the peace if, if there's no peace to start with. And that, I think that's sometimes we have um, uh, um, overtasked the international uh, peacekeeping forces in that respect. But, I, but it, the international groups, I, I think, are doing a wonderful job uh, in Africa. Uh, there's a lot to be done and um, much genocide going on there. But um, clearly from our history, I don't think the United States um, public has any stomach uh, for sending our troops to places like that. So I, I salute what, um, what, what some of the agencies in, in uh, southern Sudan and, Dar and Darfur and uh, 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 Congo are doing to alleviate the really terrible situation there. Colin Clark with DOD Buzz. Uh, first off, I'd like to hear the senator's vote counts uh, <laughs> on the F-22 and uh, whether you think it's going to be more than two <laughs> separating the Very close. Uh, sides. Um, and uh, more importantly, the 2011 budget guidance is out to the services. Uh, Secretary Gates has made a fundamental commitment to rebalancing the forces. The F-22 is all part of that. Uh, the SCS decisions, doesn't it seem as if many of the major choices that the QDR might have looked at have already been made and you're essentially going to get a, okay, this is why we did what we did and this is why we're going to do what we're going to do, QDR, instead of a true planning document looking out for the future. Greg Tomlin, George Washington University. Sir, you were just talking about Africa, and in light of the President's recent visit to Africa, I was curious if you were looking at any mention of AFRICOM specifically in this QDR. It is the first time since it was established as an independent combatant command. Thank you. Do, uh, do, do QDRs mention the commands specifically? I, I think the type of threat that we face in Africa will, will be mentioned in the QDR, whether it will mention AFRICOM I do not know, but but I will say that that continent uh, provides uh, the Taliban and Al Qaeda with a real opportunity, and and we need to pay very serious attention to it. It's not all altruism, although there's a lot of suffering there too. Uh, as as far as the coordination between current actions and what a plan for 10 or 20 years down the road is going to look like. When the same actors are doing both, it would be a shock if there wasn't coordination. Uh, if, if, if somehow uh, the Defense Department winds up doing X and then a few months later saying X doesn't really fit in with this plan that we're rolling out, I think all of us would be shocked. I don't, so there, obviously there's going to be a relationship between the two. Uh, and hopefully we are doing real planning and we recognize that decisions being made today are going to constrain what we can realistically plan to do 10 to 20 years from now. Um, on, on Africa, I, I do think it is exactly the sort of place where, where Jim's partnership of partnerships right. applies. And I do think you will, we have to have a major new emphasis on training and working with other militaries to provide their own security. Uh, and that also applies very much in, in, in many places in Africa as well as other places around the world. So the, the kinds of, in some ways, more complex situations we're going to find ourselves in for the next 20 years, I hope the QDR takes us on the road to be able to deal, have that kind of greater capability um, in, in order to be successful. Um, I, I tend to agree, I, as I mentioned earlier, I tend to f fear that QDRs become justifications for what they were already intending to do anyway. Now, now the truth is QDR comes out and obviously they can make budget adjustments. Um, before the next budget comes or and, and you know things can change and this process takes so long they have to get the guidance out so I, I don't fault that at all but but what the QDR originally intended and envisioned 
was a fresh, long-term, broad look at our national security, not a lot of spin for what we were planning to do anyway. And, and, and it's the, I, that's why I said at the beginning, the more seriously we take that part of, or, or that function, the better I feel about, about the QDR and hopefully about the nat National Defense Panel that will provide a contrasting look. We, we miss the signals in the Middle East. Uh, they're very obvious to us when it comes to Africa. This is a chance to use the QDR to do what we say it's supposed to do. Uh, so I, I anticipate uh, more than a passing mention. Uh, and the concepts that we're, that we're grappling with right now, when you come to conventional warfare versus irregular warfare, how, how you create a hybrid approach, how you have modular versus garrison-based forces that Roger referenced, is really at the heart of this, and we all know sitting in the classified briefings that we're in that uh, it, when we're successful uh, in Iraq, uh, as, as we are now on track to be, and when we stay, help stabilize what's happening in Pakistan, that those elements of chaos and destruction are moving to the Horn of Africa, uh, are moving to uh, parts of Central Africa. And the, the, the signs are clear. Let's get, let's get ready. Let's, let's, let's be ahead of this. Okay, well, thank you all of you very much for coming and spending an hour of your day with us. We greatly appreciate it. And we thank you for your insight.